All right, you ready to start? I am. Okay. Um, my name is Kathy Tipton, and I serve as the Director of Admissions here at Missouri s &T. and so we welcome you, and we're happy that you're joining us. Um, just a couple of Zoom um, rules is what I would call them for this evening, is that we do ask that you share your video if you're willing to do so. We want to see your faces and want to be able to see you interacting. Um, we will continue to have the chat for any kind of questions that you might have as um, the, the presentation or the lecture continues. Um, and that is pretty much it. I am here from admissions and I'm happy to share my information at the um, end as well. If you have any kind of general questions about the admissions process or scholarships, financial aid or where you are you know, in your, in your college search, I'm happy to help. But for now, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Merrick Lachmelis um, so he can talk to us about life on Mars. Okay, so and when Kathy said, turn your cameras on, and the reason is because this is as close to a normal lecture that we can have in times of a pandemic. But one of the big challenges that we have as professors these days is that if we don't see faces of students, we don't understand, we, we cannot see if you understand the things that we're actually saying. Okay, so if you don't really understand a lot of the things that you're hearing today, and you're afraid that it's too difficult for you as a high school student to come to college, it is much easier actually in person because in person we can see the students of faces. We can see if students don't understand the things um, that we're saying, and then we can address it directly in the classroom. So if everybody is hiding behind the screens and we're not really sure if you're listening at all, it's much more difficult for us to teach and much more difficult for you guys to learn. So um, that being, no, you don't have to have a webcam. It's just, I mean, quite frankly, I can only see one, two, three, four, five, six faces at a time anyways. It's just, um, it just makes our lives much, much easier. And it's also much nicer for me because it doesn't just seem like I'm talking to an empty screen or in my case, I'm talking actually here to, to Einstein. Okay, so anyway, so let me just get started. Okay, so I'm Dr. Merrick Lachmelis and I'm an assistant professor in the geology and geophysics program that belongs here to the Department of Geosciences and Geological and Petroleum Engineering. So a little bit of my background, I got a master's degree in geosciences from the University of Hanover in Germany in 2005. So that's why I talk so funny. And then afterwards, I moved all the way to the other side of the world. And I got a PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Macquarie University in Sydney in Australia. Afterwards, I worked for a bit at the University of Western Australia. And now I'm at Missouri S&T since 2016. And um, before that, I was actually working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So as you can see here, I'm a trained professional, and I know exactly what I'm talking about. So over the next few slides, I'm going to be showing you a little bit an excerpt from one of our classes, which is called Astronomy and Planetary Science. And if you want to start to enroll already in our summer semester, you can get a head start by taking this class. So it's a four week class over the summer semester um, from June 7th to July 2nd. Um, the lectures are Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays from 12.40 to 12.50 p.m. And these days they're going to be partially in the classroom, but you can also watch them directly um, online. So you don't have to be on campus for that because we're still living in a pandemic. So uh, you don't have to be on classes to take this course. And even though it's a 4,000 level class, it can literally be the first class that you can actually take on campus because the entrance requirements are really just the I have to move my screen around because I forget the terrible wording here all the time. So the prerequisites are ent entrance requirements for the MST program in Earth Sciences. And that basically means as soon as you're admitted to Missouri s and well, we're a science and technology university, so you directly qualify for these things. So anyway, if you have any questions about how to join this class or any of the content that I'm talking about today or anything in general, just feel free to send me an email. So email address is lachmelism 2 mstedu Okay, so, but today we're going to be talking about Mars. And if anybody has a question directly right away, just unmute yourself, ask the question, put it in the chat, and I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat on my second screen here. But basically, when you're at Missouri s and we encourage to be interrupted by students. You have a question, you don't understand anything, you want us to go over anything a second time, usually you just speak up in class and you ask the question right away. So feel free to do so um, in exactly the same way as here, okay? And as I said, everything today is real lecture material from this class, just basically copying and pasted together from different lectures. So there may be a few logical gaps for you where I'm just referring to previous classes, 
but I will try to point these ones out. And if you don't really know what I'm talking about, um, that's fine. We can fix this always when you're attending a full lecture. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about Mars. So Mars, of course, the fourth planet from the sun. It's the most distant terrestrial planet, has two moons, Deimos and Phobos, so Terra and Fear. And it's the sm uh, second smallest planet in the solar system after Mercury. And usually or very often it's also called the red planet, okay, because, well, it looks red. And it looks red because it's uh, iron oxide that's sitting on the surface and it's giving it the reddish appearance, pretty much the same way as we see here in the Australian outback. So it's called red planet, named after Mars, the Roman god of war, because blood is red, Mars is red, and this is how a lot of these things were named um, in the past. Okay, so when I say terrestrial planets, I mean those rocky planets that are primarily made out of stones here that are close to the sun. And then further out, we have the gas giants as well as the ice giants. And if you're actually ever taking this class, it's a guaranteed exam question to name all those planets that we have here in the solar system. Okay, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And how these planets really form in detail is a different story for a different lecture, but I just want to point out very briefly here is that the terrestrial planets or the rocky planets here are made of like this because they're close to the sun. So when the solar system early formed, it was really hot around here and all the gas phases and ice phases were blown away into space and only the rocky materials, so hard rocks remained that form now those rocky planets here. And then further out was cooler, so more gas survived and further out it was even cooler and more ice survived, okay? But again, that's a different story for a different lecture, but I'm reaching back a little bit to this one later on. Um, what I just want to point out here is that all those terrestrial planets here are formed in a very, very similar way. And then to understand how and if life at all developed on Mars, the best starting point is actually to understand how life started on Earth. So over the next few slides, I'm going to be showing you a little bit how Earth got started with life. And then I'm trying to export the knowledge that we have on Mars actually uh, on Earth, actually to Mars. Okay, so um, when Earth originally formed, it looked very, very different from today. Okay, so Earth was much, much hotter and the entire surface was basically molten and covered by a global magma ocean. So basically, if you're looking at pictures from Hawaii where you basically see those lava flows erupting, the entire planet pretty much looked like this. And then over time, Earth was slowly cooling down and what happened then is that we had immiscible iron liquids exhaling from silicate melts. So basically imagine if you pour olive oil into pasta water, um, oil and pasta, uh, oil and water are immiscible, so they cannot be mixed. And the same thing basically happened then with iron liquids and silicate melts. And because iron liquids are much, much heavier than the silicate melts, they sink to the bottom of this magma ocean and then eventually went on to form the solid inner core and the liquid outer core. And then we had silicate melts crystallizing into heavy silicates like olivines and pyroxenes, and they are now forming the mantle. And the lightest silicates, so like feldspars, they floated to the top and formed the uppermost layers of the crust. Okay, and this not only works for the terrestrial planets, but also work for our moon. Okay, so here you see an artist's illustration of an exoplanet, the same way as we imagined how Earth looked like 4.5 billion years ago. And you can see it's not only Earth that basically had a magma ocean, but the moon as well. And then the same processes that actually all uh, formed the layers that we have um, in Earth, we also have the same kind of layers in the moon. So the moon has a core, a mantle, as well as a crust. So the same processes that form those different layers on Earth also form the different layers on the moon. The big difference is just those remnants of this lunar magma ocean are still visible on the moon today. And everybody knows this, so because everybody once in a while looks into the sky, sees the moon. Certainly not tonight, certainly not tomorrow, but once in a while the sun actually shines, even in Rolla, Missouri. So basically, when you're looking at the moon, you see all this white stuff here. Or let me start differently. When you're looking at the moon, we have three main features. Okay, so we have these whitish areas here, those darkish areas here, and then we basically have those impact craters. And those darkish ones here, are called the lunar highlands. And they basically are remnants of this global magma ocean where all those light feldspar materials, in this case your anothytes, floated to the surface and are now still being able to, or are still visible now as whitish crustal lunar highlands as remnants from this magma ocean. 
And then we had later uh, volcanic events that form this dark maria here. And they are basically the same kind of rocks that we see deep in our mantle today. So olivine and pyroxene rich rocks. And then of course those impact craters. Okay, so Earth once looked like this. Now Earth looks differently. Can anybody know? Um, okay, let me just go to this question here. Feldspar are some examples are some examples of feldspar. So in this case here, um, those whitish rocks are the calcium and the sodium rich end member of plagioclase anorthite. But does anybody know why Earth's geology looks so drastically different than the moon, even though they all look the same four point something billion years ago? Any guesses? Any comments? There are three. All right, good. I don't even have to basically give you possible answers because Ethan is completely right. Tectonic activity. Okay, but can anybody quickly say something? Just say something in general because otherwise my headphones are going to be switching off and I have to turn them on again. Subduction. <laughs> Subduction, perfect. And I hope you said enough things for my headphones to basically not turn off. So these headphones are great for video games, but if they don't receive an audio signal for a while, they switch off. So terrible, terrible for teaching and monologues. So if some of you can just randomly say things, hopefully related to the lecture, then hopefully I don't have to restart my headphones. But yes, tectonics. And if you don't know uh, what I mean by, by plate tectonics, is the moon does not have plate tectonics, but we do. And the easiest way to see that is we have the, uh, volcanoes that we see on Earth, but we don't see any volcanoes whatsoever on the moon. So, and when I say plate tectonics, in case you have never heard it before, hmm. Okay, no, it sort of worked. Okay. Let me just, okay, here we go. So basically deep down in the earth, it's much, much hotter. And because it's much, much hotter, those rocks here are gonna be having higher buoyancy and they're gonna be moving to the surface. And for example, and then at the surface, they can basically form um, volcano chains like on, on Hawaii. They can form mid ocean ridges like this one here. And then once in a while, this oceanic crust that we're creating is gonna be subducted again, okay? so the we can have magma plumes rising up to pierce the crust like the hotspot volcanoes on Hawaii. We can have magma upwelling along mid-ocean ridges, splitting the ocean floor, creating new ocean floor. And then the new ocean floor is moving away from the center of spreading, hits eventually continental crust, and there is going to be subducted again. And then down here, it's heated up again, and we have long-lived circulation cells or convection cells that basically reshape the um, surface of the earth um, over and over again, okay? And it's what this cooling of the planet and the subsequent plate tectonics that really controlled Earth's evolution. On one hand, how it looks geologically, but it also controls um, how life evolved on our planet. Because yes, we all know that volcanoes can do really bad things. So we can have lava flows that kill everything um, because, well, they're hot. Volcanoes can emit toxic gases that can also, well, kill life forms. But at the same time, they can also add H2O to the atmosphere, so water to the atmosphere, other friendly molecules to the atmosphere. And as you're going to be seeing in a couple of slides, volcanoes or volcanic activity can also provide the energy to support um, life. Okay. So, but before we go to that, let's just talk a little bit more about the different steps it took Earth to actually go from a dead planet like this one to a cold dead planet like this one to the Earth that we basically see today because Earth is 4.55 billion years old, and it looked drastically different in each eon. And when I say eon, I basically mean the four biggest chunks that we use to distinguish different times on our planet. So first, we had the Hadean between 4.5 billion years ago and 4.0 billion years ago. That was followed by the Archean that went from 4 billion years ago to 2.5 billion years ago, and then between this and approximately 500 million years ago, we had the Proterozoic, and then everything here is clamped together as the Phenerozoic over the last 500 million years. And really the first humans are just showing up here over the last 2 million years, and really we are on our planet just for the smallest portion of time, so our appearance here is basic, basically invisible. So basically the Hadean literally looked like this, so we had a global magma ocean, the moon had a global magma ocean, and the solar system was still a mess and not as nicely organized as it is today. 
and we had lots of meteorite impacts because of that. We had a very toxic atmosphere that was not breathable at all. And basically these were conditions from hell. And this is where the name Hadean comes from, from Hades, from Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, conditions from hell. Okay, so after the Hadean, life got much better really, really fastly. So the bombardment slowed down, um, Earth cooled down, we no longer had a global magma ocean, same goes for the moon. And we slowly had continents forming and oceans forming. The atmosphere got a little bit better, but still toxic, at least for us. A lot of bacteria could already thrive in these kinds of environments. And this is why it's called the Archaea. It's derived from the ancient word Greek, Arche, the beginning. And this year's where the first life forms actually occurred on our planet, as you're going to be seeing in a few slides. Okay, so this one was then followed by the Proterozoic, where we had a little bit more complex life forms developing. And the Proterozoic is really the geological eon just before complex life on uh, complex life on Earth really began. So this is why it's called Proterozoic, because it's derived from the Greek of earlier life. And then now we're living in the Phenerozoic. Okay, so this Phenerozoic between approximately 500 million years ago until now. And it's defined by the rapid emergence and evolution of life. So therefore, it's derived from the ancient Greek words of Phenerus and Zoe, which means visible life. And that includes anything like the every geology student's favorite field object to find, fossilized trilobites to dinosaurs, or as we all know, the best animal of all times, dogs. And this year is actually Charles Emerson Winchester III, which is one of our dogs. And yes, you can bring dogs to classes. And if you bring a dog to the exam, you get a bonus point. And yes, that means if you bring 100 puppies to class, you get 100 points, okay? Just a fair heads up. Anyway, so do you have any questions so far? Um, you said that we are currently in the, um, the one that you have up now, the Phanerozoic. Which yes. one comes next, do, or do we not know yet? We do not know yet, but we do separate the Phanerozoic in much smaller parts, like the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic, and in this case here, when you're looking at a geological time scale, you basically um, have, do I have a geological time scale here? All right. If you're looking at a geological time scale, a geological time scale looks like this. Lots of stuff on there and way more than those four units that we see here. And basically the younger it gets, the more different units we have, basically because the more we know. Okay? Old rocks are very likely to be destroyed over time and we don't have many rocks from the Hadean left pretty much none actually. We have very few rocks of the Archean left and the younger we get, the more rocks we basically have. So this here is a very simplified geologic time scale. And if you're actually looking at the time scale uh, like this one here, everything that we have from the Hadean to the Proterozoic is covered by this part here. And everything else in the last 500 million years is covered by this part because we know so many more things. So the Phanerozoic is the group term that allows us to group everything together with the Hyadian, uh, Archean, and Proterozoic. But it has like, I don't know, several dozen subcategories in there that we can basically use to further narrow down where we're currently living or where our dinosaurs precisely are coming from. Does that sort of answer your questions? So why do we base the names of things from our geological past from the Greeks? I don't know. I completely agree. Everything should be named by German people. But I, I really don't know. I guess, no, I really don't have an answer to that. I guess because, well, half is from the Greek, half is from the Romans. And I guess they were just a long time, the first civilizations that really started science. So we basically just um, um, used their words. I was wondering what prevented the moon from developing similar uh, core conditions that would facilitate plate tectonics and or motion to continue the, to create something kind of like Earth has. Do we know what prevented that from happening? Do we know what made it happen on Earth or is that still kind of up in the air? Okay, what really started plate tectonics on Earth um, is not that well understood and we don't even know the precise timing when it started. Um, for, as it goes for um, the moon, 
Well, that's a completely different lecture for actually an entire week. Uh, but it comes down to is the what, how the way the moon formed. So the moon formed um, as far as we know, and it's commonly accepted hypothesis that we had a huge meteorite impact and the meteorite was called Thayer, was hitting Earth and ripping out a huge chunk of our planet. And of course, it was ripping out only the light stuff at the surface and it was not really ripping out the dense core stuff that we have deep down in the Earth. So overall, the moon has a much different density than Earth has and has therefore a different ratio of its core to a silicate crust. And it's probably this ratio to the core of the silicate crust, as well as the um, diameter of the moon, that prevents plate tectonics from happening. Because for plate tectonics to happen, you have to have deep, have to have tight, oh, have to have high temperatures deep down in the earth. And um, but the moon is not as high of a radius as Earth, so you cannot really go high enough into the moon to really form the high temperatures required for man um, for for mantle convection. Ah, so it's, compo it's composition, it's the ratio of mantle to crust to core, and then the diameter of the moon. But really how important each individual point is, is really just active research and still has to be done. Because you have to keep in mind, all that we know from the moon is from space missions 50 years ago in remote sensing. So lots of stuff still to be learned. OK, so Pangea was somewhere around here. OK, any questions or shall we move on? Because we haven't talked about Mars yet. OK, so Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic, Phenerozoic. OK, life on Earth didn't just start like this, um, but several key conditions had to come together at the same time to actually um, allow life to happen. OK, so right now we think that at least for life as we know it on Earth, because really Earth is the only life that we have ever seen. So but when it comes to life on Earth, we think that six preconditions must be met for life to actually form. And again, when I say life, I mean life as we know it today on our planet. Who knows what's really going on elsewhere in the universe? But for carbon-based life forms as us, we have six preconditions. The first one is temperature, because temperature is important because it influences how quickly atoms and molecules move and controls states of matter. And of course, if it's too cold, things freeze to death. If it's getting too hot, they're just fried to death. So we need to have a specific temperature interval that is um, good for allowing for life. And among these is actually water, because for life as we know it, we need liquid water on the surface because water dissolves and transports chemicals as well as nutrients to cells and from within, within cells. This is why we have to drink. And of course, water is directly controlled by temperature. And we are lucky on our planet that we actually have plenty of liquid water on the surface. If you're completely on an ice planet, it's going to be much more difficult to actually sustain life because we don't have water and that allows you to feed your cells in your body and then you die. Another precondition for life as we know it is that we need an atmosphere because on one hand, an atmosphere provides chemicals that we need for life, but it also shields us from extraterrestrial harmful radiation. Okay, think ozone layer um, at the poles that we have or uh, ozone holes. And what helps here also is if we have a core, because in our planet, we have an out, uh, inner uh, solid core, an outer liquid core, and we have convection currents going on in this core that can, uh, creates a magnetic field. And this magnetic field also shields us from harmful radiation. And then, of course, for life to develop, we need an energy source. And that can be either light, so sunlight, photosynthesis, and these kinds of things, or it can be chemical energy associated with volcanoes that we see in a couple of slides. And energy also affects temperature, of course, which then affects water and potentially the presence of an atmosphere if we have greenhouse gases like CO2. Another thing that we need are nutrients, okay? Because we need to eat, we don't eat, we die. And the good thing is that nutrients, basically the entire periodic table is available on any kind of rocky planet because it's bound in minerals, okay? so. Nutrients are plentiful on all the rocky bodies that we have in our solar system. But then again, we need a transport mechanism that allows us to dissolve rocks and then eventually feed ourselves and the cells in our body. 
and that can be volcanic activity or again um, just water again so that's why we drink and then one thing that is very often overlooked um, we can have all these preconditions being met but none of this is of any meaning if they don't occur at the same time and for a long enough period of time for life to actually evolve okay so on earth we think that the pre, uh, all these six preconditions came together for the first time uh, 3.8 million to 4.3 billion years ago so pretty shortly after earth uh, just formed 4.55 billion years ago so this year is an article from the journal um called nature that came out in 2017 and that basically is still sort of the state of the art stating that evidence for early life in earth's oldest hydrothermal vents precipitates and the study found that microorganisms that are at least 3.8 billion and possibly 4.3 billion years old were found in sedimentary rocks and these ones were interpreted as seafloor hydrothermal vent related precipitates in a location um, in canada and this really should, so the first life on our planet may have been formed in or on deep ocean floors along hydrothermal vents, which really should not be a surprise because these areas on our planet are still full of life today. Okay, so when we're thinking plate tectonics again, and let's see if we can move this one here again. So, okay, so we talk plate tectonics, and then we basically say uh, we have upwelling of mantle and upwelling magmas then split the ocean floor and create new oceanic crust along these ridges here well those ridges here are really in the sort of okay central portions doesn't look like it but are important part of ocean basins and we can basically see those mid-ocean ridges all over our oceans and because this is where ocean floor is spreading and we have hot magmas upwelling ocean water from here can be drawn down can be heated up by the magma and then they basically um, exhaled again as hydrothermal vents, either as black smoke or at lower temperatures, a different composition, also as white smoke. And on one hand, they, they can form significant sulfide ore deposits that we could potentially mine for metals in the future. Um, but those um, hydrothermal vents here um, really support, uh, provide a lot of chemical energy to actually support life on the ocean floor far away from sunlight. Okay. So in this case, of course, if you have an ocean sitting on top of these vents, you no longer need an atmosphere that is in favor because those life forms here never come in contact with um, the atmosphere anyways. And you also don't really need that much of an atmosphere to shield you from harmful radiations because you have several thousands of meters of water actually on top. And we know basically that along these mid-ocean ridges where we have these hydrothermal vents, we can basically have lots and lots of different life forms forming or living today. And based on the geological record, we know or we think that those hydrothermal vents may have allowed for the development of early life as early as 250 million years after Earth basically formed and cooled down from this global magma ocean. Okay, so the question of course is, why do these things happen on Earth? And why don't they really happen on Mars? Or let me phrase it differently. So let's just have a look very briefly on what of these preconditions for life on Earth can actually also be found at Mars. Okay. To do that, does anybody know what this rock is, how this rock type is called, how it forms, or have you perhaps seen this picture in the media over the last few years and know why this was really, really groundbreaking in Mars research? Looks like a conglomerate. Looks like a conglomerate. Awesome. It is a conglomerate. Do, can you actually describe what a conglomerate is? Um, it's basically just a mixture um, of large particles and small particles and one um, lithification. Exactly. And do you know how they form? Um, sedimentary processes, basically breaking down. And either, uh, what are sedimentary processes? Um, erosion due to rainwater or just water in general running over rock or rock hitting other rocks and breaking down. It's basically just breaking down large material into smaller material. Using water for conglomerates. Okay, so that's the key thing. The interesting thing is just the left-hand rock was found on Mars and the right-hand one was found on Earth. And because we know that on Earth, 
these rocks can really only form in the presence of water. Well, this was the first evidence, the first solid evidence that we really had in 2012, thanks to the Curiosity rover, that at one point we had open waters on Mars, rivers, lakes, maybe even oceans. Okay, so Curiosity in 2012 found conglomerates on Mars. We know conglomerates on Earth require the formation of water, so there must have been rivers on Mars as well. And this was really in 2012, the first solid evidence that we had that there actually was water at one point on the surface on Mars. And since then, it has been confirmed by several studies and that also look at other sedimentary structures that we know can only form in the presence of water. Okay, so apparently, one of the preconditions that we actually have for life on Earth, the presence of water, also works very well on Mars. And the same actually goes for temperature. Maybe not so much today, but in the past, okay? So if we're looking at the surface temperature on Mars these days, the average is minus 60 degrees Celsius. Polar winter is minus 125 degrees Celsius. And if you ever study um, uh, STEM fields or a science field, then I'm already telling you right now, you really have to get used to using Celsius in science. And Fahrenheit, um, you can still see in Wikipedia, but most of the lectures are based on the metric system. But so winter is really cold, average surface temperature is really cold, but in the summers, um, Mars can actually, the equatorial regions reach up to 20 degrees Celsius, even though it can go down to minus 70 at night. But theoretically, we actually have enough energy and good enough temperatures today for Mars to sustain life as we know it. Maybe not so much today, but certainly in the past, because in this example of a Gale crater where Curiosity was moving around, and we really see evidence for ancient freshwater lakes which was really favorable for microbial life, at least theoretically, and theoretically billions of years ago, because today we still have OH-rich soils, and of course, oxygen, hydrogen are the building blocks of water. Okay, so just by looking at the presence of fresh water, and that even today, the summers are reaching up to 20 degrees Celsius on Mars, we can basically see that several preconditions of life, or for life on Mars, existed at one point, okay? We had water, that means temperature was good, energy good enough, because at least sunlight reaches enough the Martian surface that we have still have temperatures of up to 20 degrees Celsius. And of course, we have plenty of nutrients because Mars has basically the same kinds of rocks that we basically have today. Okay, so four preconditions are already met, and water, temperature, and energy all must have occurred at the same time because well, otherwise we would not have had liquid water on the surface. Nutrients also met because, well, we have rocks. So the big question is just, did Mars actually have also an atmosphere that allowed us to develop life? And did all those six preconditions occur for a long enough period of time to really allow for the development of life on early Mars? Okay, so certainly not today when it comes to the atmosphere, because if you're looking at the Martian atmosphere, it's about one hundredth of that of Earth. So it's too thin for shielding from, uh, from harmful radiation and it's too thin for trapping heat. So even though we primarily have CO2 in the atmosphere, and theoretically it should be good enough to develop a greenhouse gas effect that heats up the atmosphere, the atmosphere is overall so thin that no significant warming of the atmosphere takes place. And the exact opposite is actually the case on Venus. Okay, so Venus has an extremely thick atmosphere, um, has 400 and something degrees Celsius daytime, nighttime, uh, 365 days of the terrestrial year, but the Martian atmosphere is exactly the opposite. So very thin atmosphere, doesn't allow for trapping of um, heat, and of course for us it's pretty toxic to breathe because to really sustain life, at least human life, we need oxygen concentrations that are approximately 20% and higher than this one here. But that being said, and this goes back to one of the very early things that I mentioned, Mars was actually even further, or is still further away from the sun as Earth, so that basically means initially when Mars formed, it formed under cooler conditions. So Mars theoretically must have contained a greater abundance of volatile elements than Earth had. Again, different story for a different day, but it basically goes back to the distance from between Mars and the sun. And the further away you are from the sun, the cooler it was when the planets originally formed. And the further out in the solar system, the more volatiles and ices basically survived. So early Mars must have contained actually much greater amounts of volatiles in an early atmosphere than Earth did. Um, 
Another problem, however, is that currently Mars does not have a magnetic field that would allow it to shield from harmful radiation. But looking at the rock record of Mars, we all actually know that at one point in time, Mars actually did have a protective magnetic field that just for one reason or another um, basically was um, shut off. So let's see. Um, could you explain what volatile elements are? Volatile elements are all the elements that preferentially um, go into gas phases. Hydrogen, oxygen, CO2, all the stuff that we basically have in the atmosphere. So we have lithophile elements that are preferentially bound in rocks, so magnesium, silica, um, aluminum. And then basically volatile elements are the ones that don't like to be in rocks and they preferentially go into the atmosphere. So basically everything that you see up here is a volatile element. Okay, so, um, okay, what would have caused Mars to lose its atmosphere? And we're going to this one right now, okay? So during the early stages, so we see that uh, Mars probably had a dense primordial atmosphere and was very similar to the early Earth. And that basically, and we're looking at the evolution of Mars, you can actually see based on the rock record and what we know, is that so this is the these are the eons that we talked about on earth these are the counterparts for mars and we can basically see that up until 3.1 billion years ago mars was very very similar with everything com um, when compared to earth and it's only all during the amazonian that mars really started to become those death desolate um, planet that we see in the solar system and when we're looking at how long it took for life to develop first on earth we can basically see, assuming the sa similar conditions between Earth and Mars, we had plenty of time for life to actually develop on Mars as well. So the question is just, if all those conditions come together for a significant amount of time, why do we see life on Earth, but why not on Mars? So does it mainly mean, maybe mean that early life on Mars existed in the same way as it did on Earth, but eventually became extinct? And if that really is the case, well, then, of course, it will be um, preserved in geological record, just as we see um, on Earth. So the big question is, why does Earth, why if Mars started out exactly the same way as Earth, and basically went the same kind of evolutionary planetary path for the first billion years, why does Mars not look like this, but is the dead planet that we basically see today? Okay, because all those six preconditions that we have for life on Mars, really seem to have come together, not today on Mars, but in the early stages of the Martian evolution when Mars was much more similar to it, um, to Earth, or much more similar to the early Earth as it is to Mars, how it looks today. So, and again, we can look at Earth to try to see what kind of evidence we see for life on early Earth. And then we can try to find the same kind of evidence also on Mars. And a good easy way to do that is something that has been shown to be a reliable record for life in the ge uh, geological record on Earth for the last billions of years are a rock type called um, stromatolites. Okay, so stromatolites are layered biochemical accretionary structures that form in shallow ocean waters by sedimentation or cementation of sedimentary grains by microbial mats of microorganisms. So that's a textbook definition. And those microbial mats are composed of cyanobacteria that really basically work to cement those um, structures together. And bacteria, of course, are life forms. So that basically means we see stromatolites on Earth in rocks that are at least 3.8 billion years ago, perhaps 4.3 billion years ago. And whenever we see these kinds of rocks, we know they must have been formed from microbes. So there must have been life on Earth this long ago. That basically means if early Mars was similar to early Earth, then we could theoretically also expect stromatolites on Mars. And if we find the same structures on extraterrestrial bodies, so not only on Mars, but on other planets in general, that on Earth are evidence for life, well, that would be an also evidence for the presence of extraterrestrial life, okay? The same way as we talked about water on Mars. We found a conglomerate, conglomerates requires water, so there must have been water on Mars. So if we found a stromatolite on Mars, it basically means there must have been life on Mars at one point. And of course, that um, evidence for life is uh, recorded in the geological record, 
should not really come as a surprise because we all know this from dinosaurs, okay? Nobody has really seen dinosaurs in real life, but we know they existed because you can go out to the fields and you can find fossilized bone that you can dig out and you can as, um, then basically um, assemble skeletons. And this is how we know dinosaurs live. This is how we know how they look like. And then we can look at fossilized footprints to basically tell us how they behave. So were they loners? Um, did they live in herds? Um, did the kids live together with the parents or not? So all these kinds of things that we know about dinosaurs, we know from rocks, we know it from geology. And this applies on one hand to our own geological record on Earth, but it's easily convertible also to Mars. Okay, So if we find dinosaur bones on Mars, it means dinosaurs must have existed on Mars. The problem is just on our planet, um, dinosaurs developed in the Phenerozoic and uh, Mars never got to the stage. Life turned into, uh, Mars turned into this dead red planet much, much before that, okay? So any questions so far? What about just a random question so that my headphones don't switch off? I was just wondering uh, since theoretically Mars was supposed to have a higher volatile content than Earth based on its location. Mm -hmm. um, and since we've seen that a lot of water comes out of the Earth, uh, Earth's mantle, uh, would you think that there's a lot of water still in the Martian mantle or possibly back when they were uh, around the same stage of evolution? if Mars would have equivalent or even more water than Earth? Okay, so what happens is that, yes, theoretically, we can have lots and lots of water degassing from volcanoes on Mars. And theoretically, we could also try to melt those ices here at the polar caps, trying to create a global ocean on Mars, just by heating it up. And the problem, however, is that the surface pressure of Mars is significantly lower than on Earth. and if you have any, um, on Earth, we are lucky that the conditions at the surface are just around the triple point of water. So on Earth, we can have water, ice, and gas in the atmosphere coexisting. So when I say gas, I mean H2O vapor. On Mars, that's different because the surface temperature of Mars is so low um, that even if you're melting all this ice, it's gonna be subliming. So if you're melting the ice caps on Mars, or if you basically theoretically have water erupting from volcanoes, you will never find liquid water on the surface of Mars because under these low surface temperatures, water is just not a stable phase. All the ice that you're melting will directly go into the gas phase and because of the lack of an atmosphere and because of the lack of a magnetic field, will go directly out into space. Does it make sense? During the... Um... Noachian, similar to the Hadean on Earth, uh, yes. would the atmospheric pressure still be too low? No. I mean, there's conglomerates, so must not have been too low for liquid water. Um, back then, Mars actually is supposed to have a really, really dense atmosphere that will increase the atmospheric pressure. So water on Mars would be a very, very likely scenario, which is also shown in the rock record because we have lots of sedimentary rocks that require water to form. So something happened on Mars that basically had it lose its atmosphere. And what's that is because, um, well, we're gonna be going to this in the next slides. I'm just basically looking at the question why is the most recent period of Mars called Amazonian? Because Jeff Bezos was in charge. You cannot argue with that at all. Okay, I, I still keep thinking that we should change the name of our department to Starbucks or something like that, just to bring in some extra cash. Okay, so the periods of Mars are different, just basically to distinguish them from Earth because of different planets. How do we know there was liquid water and not some other type of liquid? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So actually we do still see evidence of liquid somethings on the Martian surface today. And they're not complete water, but they're very, very salty brines. Okay, so salty brines have a different composition and they have a different um, evaporation point, different evaporation pressure. 
So under some instances in some permanently dark craters on Mars, we actually do ev see evidence of liquids that are not water in our ocean water sense, but they're really, really salty, salty brines. And how do we know it's liquid water, not some other type of liquids? Um, it's just because um, the rocks are very similar between Earth and Mars, and the conditions are very similar. So water is really just the, the most likely explanation that we have at this point. But again, we have never really seen water on Mars. We have just a couple of rovers that are driving around there. So I don't know, maybe this is imprecise and maybe there's more to be found out um, with the latest Mars rover Perseverance. Good question. Um, the only answer that I really have is because that's what we currently think was the case. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so but basically to um, cover sort of what Caden was just mentioning, if Mars was once so similar to Earth and possibly hosted primitive, uh, primitive life forms very early on, well, what happened to it? Why again, doesn't it not look like this? And of course, um, again, when we're comparing this one to Earth, we can basically see what um, Earth really, really is going through that can really affect life are mass extinctions. So if you're looking at the Phenerozoic, so the last 500 million years or so, we had five massive mass extinction that in some cases actually um, really, really uh, killed up to 60% of all the animal families uh, between the Permian and Triassic. Biggest mass extinction, the most famous, uh, the biggest one, the most famous one, of course, is the one that killed the dinosaurs. And we basically know from different kinds of studies um, that's um, mass extinctions and all likeliness are killed by meteorite impacts, volcanic events or large scale volcanic events or a combination of both. And just trying to keep up with the chats and what causes brine to Mars to be salty, probably salt, which is the correct answer. Okay, If we have water that basically erodes minerals that are rich in sodium and chloride, then we form a fluid that is sodium chloride rich, which is salty. Okay, So the geology always controls the composition of the water. Okay, so at mass extinctions on Earth are triggered in the past or have been triggered in the past by meteorite impacts. Um, they can be triggered by volcanic events. So large magmatic events, not like Hawaii, but really something that covers entire countries. And they're called large igneous provinces or a combination of both. And how long did mass extinctions events approximately take? Uh, that's a good question. We don't really know. For the dinosaurs, we basically think a couple of days followed by a couple of years or decades of really, really bad um, living conditions. But to really, for a mass extinction to go from start of the mass extinction to the end, it can take a couple of um, million years. Do you think that the extinctions of the animals is, so I'm reading the chat again, is what caused the atmosphere to dissipate because of no longer having these animals producing gases through life processes? Um, Possibly, but there's actually really spectacular evidence that on Mars, what really caused the mass extinction that basically turned it into such a, or when I say mass extinction, we don't know if it's a mass extinction because we don't really know if life ever existed on Mars. But what really messed with Mars is something that we think may have been a large meteorite impact or a large um, volcanic tectonic event, which is now evident in something that we call the Martian dichotomy. And the Martian economy is basically what is shown on this topographical map here. So we can basically see on this map, the Northern hemisphere contains a huge topographic depression. And this area here is an average three to six kilometers lower than most of the Southern regions here, with exception of this one here, of course. So we don't really understand now what really causes depression here, but we think it's either related to one or more major, major meteorite impacts, or possibly an early episode of plate tectonics, so mantle processes that really um, overturned the mantle here and that are very similar then to our planet's layered uh, large igneous complexes that are also have been linked to mass extinctions. So one way or another, we had something really, really bad going on in Mars here. And if there was early life on Mars, maybe this is one of the reasons why, well, it doesn't look like um, in Rick and Morty right now. And what is supporting that a little bit is because we know at one point in time, Mars did have a magnetic field 
that shielded the surface from harmful radiation the same way as we have it on our planet. And again, different topic for a different day, but the convection currents that we have now out of core are basically what is creating the magnetic field that we see on Earth. So one hypothesis is that basically this Martian dichotomy is an evidence for a large meteor impact that really messed with the convection currents in the outer core of Mars. And when I say outer core, let's say the liquid core of Mars that really messed up the convection currents and then just switched off the magnetic fields. So all of a sudden we no longer have a magnetic field on Mars. We no longer have protection from harmful radiation. And that then over time really fried the planet and killed everything that we had living on the surface. And that means life on Mars may be extinct now, but if it ever existed before this great economy was formed, then it should be preserved in geological record. Okay, I'm just going through those slides here first, and then we're gonna be seeing if there are any kind of um, uh, questions are gonna be answered. Okay, so life on Mars may be extinct now, but if it actually existed prior to the formation of the Martian economy, we will see it in the geological record. And of course, this is really what NASA is going for these days. So on one hand, Curiosity found evidence already for water on the Martian surface. But then a few days later, also in Gale Crater, it started to find organic matters in mudstones. And of course, organic matter are the building blocks of life and are good evidence for the fact that, or not the fact, for the hypothesis that life at one point actually existed on Mars, just became extinct um, in times younger than 3 billion years old. Okay, and of course, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard that Perseverance was landing on the Martian surface a few weeks ago. And the main job of Perseverance, as quoted from the NASA website, is seek to say, to is seek, okay, I'm Germanizing the language here right now. So its main job is to seek signs of ancient life and basically collect samples of rock regoliths for possible return to Earth. Because again, the theory being, or not the theory being, but the fact being, if life at one point existed on Mars, it must be still preserved in geological record because, well, it is on Earth and all those terrestrial planets formed in a very similar way. Okay, so if you actually are interested in these kinds of things, okay, it's not only NASA that is building rovers, but you can actually really contribute to the Martian rover development for future Mars rovers um, at Missouri s &T. So we have a student design team that really is focusing on building new Mars rovers. And we're usually scoring in the top five in this international contest. So each year, not this year because of COVID, but most other years, um, there really is an international Mars rover competition where a student design group actually is designing a Mars rover. And then they're sending it out to Utah to participate in the university rover challenge. And the Mars rover that is built at a university, like uh, this one here, Samara from 2017, has to do a, a parkour course, and the best rover basically wins. So we're usually scoring the top five. 2017, we won. The year afterwards, we basically uh, scored second. And really, just for the reason, I'm pretty sure that NASA didn't want to give the award twice to Missouri s in a row. Um, but basically, of course, when you guys are going to be joining this design team, I'm totally expecting all of you to be winning again. That being said, if you say I'm not into engineering, I'm more into sciences, um, well, it doesn't really matter because the engineers can basically build those rovers, but it's basically still the scientists and especially the geologists that tell the engineers where to put it on Mars and what to do with it. Okay, so if you're not interested in Mars rovers, um, Missouri s and actually a couple of weeks ago also won a NASA Big Idea Challenge grant. And this is again a student group that was basically winning this grant and they got a grant from NASA to um, develop new ways to remove lunar dust from power producing solar cells, which of course is the very first step if we actually want to um, set up a lunar base. Okay, okay. that being said, um, life on Mars or Mars is not really the most way to actually look for life, the best and most promising place to look for extraterrestrial life is Enceladus, okay? Enceladus is the moon of Saturn here, has a very low surface temperature of minus 200 degrees Celsius, which means it's hostile to life as we know it. But at the same time, under this ice crust here, um, Enceladus has a huge water ocean. And if there ever is any life today in our solar system, it would be swimming right now in the oceans beneath the ice crust of Enceladus. But if you want to know more, know, uh, more know, 
if you want to know more about it, then you actually have to roll into the class. And again, you can take this class already in the summer if you want to. You don't even have to be on campus for that. And even though it's a 4,000 level class, you can take it right away because the entrance requirements, well, you meet those ones as soon as you're admitted to Missouri s &T. Questions about that? Um, ask me via lockmelas.mst.edu. And that actually is the end of the presentation. So does anybody have a question while I'm working my way through the chat when our last start? Kaylin can answer questions too, okay? She's my wingman. Okay, so we went through this one. We had the brines. Oh yes, I would guess the brines is the salt from the salt water, all infused into a small amount of water. Good point, very, very possible. Didn't think of that, but yep, that's a good possibility. Could we strap engines to an asteroid and hit Mars with it in an attempt to restart the magnetic field? Isn't there a movie called The Core where basically the magnetic field on Earth stops and they're sending nuclear bombs in it to kickstart it or something like that? Wasn't it the storyline? I think I saw it on Showtime. And it's been a long time since I watched it, okay? so. Watch the movie The Core, and that's going to be giving an answer to that. Asteroid, I don't think so, because the problem that we had, the, the asteroid would be big enough to really, really cause a huge debris field. So we can restart the magnetic field on Earth, uh, on Mars, but at the same time, we'd be creating so much of a meteorite shower that we kill all the life on Earth. Assuming that Jupiter doesn't eat up all the meteorites as it usually does. Okay, so is the chemical composition of lower altitude regions of Mars different from high altitude regions? I'm sorry, I really have no idea. Okay, so part of it is because I haven't looked it up, but the other part of it is that we have a very limited understanding of the surface geology on Mars because it's not our planet. So sorry, can't answer this one. Don't know the answer to that. Um, do you think it could be a future prospect to arti artificially increase greenhouse gases in order to warm Mars to prepare for human life? Theoretically, yes, but you would have to actually create a way first how you increase the surface pressure on Mars to get around the problem that all the ice directly evaporates into the atmosphere, skipping the water phase. So first you have to figure out how you increase the surface pressure, and then basically you can figure out how to make it more livable um, for us. So yes, you can increase greenhouse gases to basically increase the temperature, but you have to figure out how you trap an atmosphere to a planet that doesn't have a magnetic field and has to overcome the problems with low surface pressures. But theoretically, terraforming is a possibility, yes. Do we know how the moons are formed? Like we're formed at our moons, and if so, could we find life records on them? No, we don't know how the Martian moons formed. The problem is the Martian moons moves. The Martian moons are really, really weird. So they are just like a fraction of the size of our moon. They're just a few kilometers in diameter and they have a really, really weird shape. And it's still a very active area of research to see how those moons actually formed. And one possibility is that we're just trapped uh, meteorites that were coming from somewhere else in the solar system and just were forced into a calm orbit of uh, Mars which is very, very unlikely because it's very difficult to actually for a planet to catch an asteroid or a meteorite or a comet and force it into a calm orbit. Sooner or later, it's going to be ejected out again or collide. And possibility is that um, the, the moons on uh, around Mars were one big moon in the beginning. And just because of tidal forces inserted by or forced onto them on Mars, ripped apart and formed smaller moons now. Um, and I think that actually there was a paper coming out last week that suggested this was the place. So we don't really know how the moons were, are formed on Mars, but best guess right now is they formed as one big moon and ripped apart into two smaller moons. 
Maybe the asteroid that threw off the magnetic field also led to the formation of the moons. Yeah, basically the same thing. So that would basically be a model that is a creche model for our moon. So assuming that the moons then on Mars formed the same way as our moon. In the past, the problem was it was difficult to understand why we have two smaller moons like this and not much of a bigger debris field. But maybe they were just part of a bigger moon that formed from an impact the same way as our moon. And then they were just ripped apart um, afterwards. So yeah, good question as well. Okay, any oral questions so that I can actually catch my breath a little bit? Get used to it in class. I'm talking way, way too fast. And over 20 years, I haven't figured out how to talk slower. And I kind of give up on this one, as Caden can confirm. Uh, yeah. Is there any, any is there any other moon or planetary body that you uh, besides uh, and uh, sorry uh, don't I forget how to say it, the moon this particular moon of Saturn it's that latest. we would yeah that we would yeah. consider likely for potentially having life yes Titan around uh, Jupiter uh, not um, all right. And then there's a uh, okay. Part of I really have to look at it up now, but I'm pretty sure Titan goes around Jupiter. Yeah, I believe so as well. But I was more referring to Europa, and this is a yeah, Europa, a Europa, chat. exactly the same. Titanium, Europa, both work. Okay, mm -hmm. Titanium and Europa. Um, the difference is just that we recently had um, probes going around Enceladus and finding actually pretty spectacular evidence for okay. Remember when I talked about those hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor and how on our planet they're full of life? Okay, and when the space probe was flying over the southern poles, we see gas emissions that are very, very similar to the gases produced along hydrothermal vents along our mid ocean ridges. And the idea is then basically that we have active volcanic vents on the ocean floor of Enceladus that are similar to the ones on Earth. And if they are similar to the ones on Earth, what well, chances are that they are full of life as well? with a very, very, very big question mark because, well, we haven't been there yet. But theoretically, if you would ask people what's the most likely component to find living organisms in our solar system right now, the answer most likely would be Enceladus because they have the same kind of hydrothermal vents at the bottom of these ocean floors, the sub-ice ocean floors that are similar to the ones on Earth. And because on Earth there's life, chances are in Enceladus there could be life as well. I don't have a favorites design team. I don't play favorites. I like the ones that are winning usually, because I'm German. Uh, I the, the ice cross on Enceladus is several dozens of kilometers thick. Pretty sure it would be costly. Okay, so why don't we just take the water from Enceladus and move it to Mars? Because we'd still have to overcome the problem with the low surface pressure. So even that we bring the ice from Enceladus to Mars and heat it up, and because the surface pressure is so low, it would evaporate directly into the gas phase and we would skip the liquid water phase. Um, okay, more well, water questions, I think I answered those. Um, what do you mean by Martian moons are a weird shape? Okay, um, our moon is round and um, the Martian moons are way more like peanut shaped, okay? so. Of course, if you have a planet that is rotating around its own for a long time or, or, or um, a moon that is rotating around its own axis for a long time, it will at one point uh, come to the shape of a, of, a, of, a, of a ball because that allows it to have um, the least surface, uh, the best, more favorable, most favorable ratio of surface area to volume. So over time, if you're spinning stuff, it eventually in space will turn into a globe. But that's not the case for the ones of Martian of the Martian moons. They look more like peanuts. Yeah, one peanut, one egg. Is there a possibility that we can create a bubble on Mars where all the necessity of life would be and eventually start a colony of people? Yes, exactly, that is possible. And that, of course, is what Mar what NASA is currently looking at. So the idea here would be, and this is what Kaylin was a little bit doing as part of her um, thesis, is to understand the geology of Mars using the same tools that we have on Earth. 
So in this case, primarily to identify where we have ore deposits that we can mine for metals and those metals that we can basically use to form uh, to build houses. Because of course, if we want to build a colony on Mars, we cannot bring all the steel that we want to bring with us because steel is heavy and is expensive. So ideally in the future, we want to be living in an area in Mars that contains big ore deposits and we can use um, knowledge from Earth to find ore deposits on Mars or areas that are most likely to, for, to contain ore deposits on Mars to make it an easier start. And the same goes actually for water. So theoretically, if we like a biodome, if we have it on the surface, yeah, we can build a biodome, but we still cannot bring all the water that we need from Earth to Mars. And one possibility is you can basically get the water out of rocks because we know we have lots of clay minerals on Mars and clay minerals can actually contain up to 60% of water depending on the clay mineral that we have. So we can process the clay minerals, extract OH groups from those ones and turn them into water. And that of course requires again that we have to identify areas on Mars that have the highest water content clay minerals on the surface to make it as easy as possible for us to actually form, uh, to build a Martian deposit. Okay, so but biodomes are basically very, very, very similar. You guys know actually about the um, biodome that we're building, I think in the Arizona desert in the 80s or something like that. And there's actually a documentary, I think, on Hulu that you can watch on this biodome. And oh yeah, they did make a movie about a biodome. They made two ones. They made one with Paulie Shore. That's it gets it's actually a pretty good movie. Okay, I can't lie, it's a good movie, but there's also a documentary. And the documentary is basically trying to say how badly the biodome failed because they couldn't sustain life in there for a long period of time. But scientifically, that's a wrong approach because the biodome was very, very important for understanding the shortcomings of an isolated dome. Because we can now go back to what we learned from the biodome. The problem that they had basically is they had problems with oxygen. So over time, we were breathing too much oxygen, exhaling too much CO2, and that threw off the oxygen balance and they had to inject additional oxygen into the system to actually sustain life. So, and a lot of people say that's a failure and that basically means the biodome experiment failed. No, it didn't. It just showed us what we have to do better in the future. And this is what science really is about. You make an experiment, you basically see where it doesn't work, and then you revisit it and you try to improve it in the future. So the biodome that was built showed us that there are problems with the oxygen supply in an isolated system over an elongated period of time. But of course, it's a good thing because now we can basically figure out how to fix this in the future. And it's better to figure out these shortcomings on Earth than if you're already on Mars and you're trying to build these things, okay? Because no one hears you scream in space, basically. Okay, so yes, so yes, there is a movie and a documentary, and I think it's actually on Netflix. Is there a chance where Mars was closer or further from the sun that the surface pressure was higher? And that's when there were life forms. Um, no, Mars was probably uh, in the same orbit at all times, because if Mars would not have been in the same orbit, um, it means it would have been either colliding with Earth or more likely actually be sucked up by the gravitational field of the sun or by Jupiter. So Mars was probably at all times sort of where it is right now. If it would have been closer to Jupiter, it's actually basically what you see. So you guys know there's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This was probably at one point a planet in the making that was trying to accrete together into a planet the same way as Mars, but it was so close to the gravitation field of Jupiter that Jupiter was just bullying it around and never allowed it to actually form a planet. And this is why it's so important that we have Jupiter in our solar system, because most of the asteroids that could potentially hit Earth are eaten up by Jupiter and its gravitational field. So Jupiter is the best um, protective shield that we can basically have. Could humans eventually evolve to be able to live within Mars atmosphere? Over billions of atmos years, theoretically, yes. The problem is just it's not possible because our sun will not live for that long. So our sun is approximately also the same age as our Earth, so 4.6 billion years old, and it's halfway through a stage of burning um, hydrogen to basically look at this as today. In another 4.5 billion years, um, Earth will have burned through the hydrogen, will start to burn helium, and then it's gonna be turning into a red giant. And the red giant will be so big 
that it's going to be probably eating up Earth and probably also eating up Mars. So that basically means, yes, theoretically, in 4.5 billion years, we could be living on Mars and adapted to the Martian atmosphere. But realistically, our solar system will be dead by then because our sun would have bloated up into a red giant. Okay, next question. Are there any liquids other than water which have the properties to facilitate some form of life, even vastly different from what we are familiar with? Um, yes, of course. So everything that I was talking about as the preconditions of life is really just life as we know it today. And it's really difficult to understand how life would look like that we don't know about because we just don't have any experience with it. So yes, very possible. Um, how it would look like, I really don't know. And this is actually one of the problems that we have when we're trying to look for extraterrestrial life. Because if we are looking for extraterrestrial life, we're looking for people like us. We don't look for life forms that we're not familiar with. So in a lot of ways, there may be life out there. We are just not really able to recognize it as life because it's not at all what we're expecting. And um, could the dwarf planet in the asteroid belt be considered the core of this potential protoplanet? Um, yes and no. Okay, so, so when we're looking, so dwarf planets um, will probably have their own core. But when you're looking at meteorites, you see that we have three main kinds of meteorites. We have stony meteorites, iron meteorites, and stony iron meteorites. And those iron meteorites, we actually know from, again, different lecture for a different day, but we know based on the textures and the composition of those iron meteorites that they actually are the cores of protoplanets. So they basically, at one point, were part of a protoplanet that collided probably with another protoplanet. It completely ripped it apart liberated the core from everything else, and then basically was just entering Earth's atmosphere as an iron meteorite. But these ones are really the cores of other protoplanets. Uh, what's my opinion on Pluto? Um, after my dogs, totally one of my favorite dogs, exactly. And if you're referring to if it's a planet or not, no, I think I have to agree with uh, the Planetary Commission. It's not a planet because one of the key conditions for the formation of a planet is that it actually has to have a cleared out its orbit from other materials. And that's just not the, the case of Pluto. So on Earth, we basically see, um, we don't have, okay, so how do we phrase that? Um, Earth goes around the sun and pretty much never really collides with any meteorites that are big because it already cleared out its orbit around the sun four point something billion years ago. So in the beginning, when you're thinking back about the stuff that I said about the Hadean, and there were, Meteor impacts were much, much more common in the early stages of our solar system because we had much more space debris flying around and it took the planets quite a while to actually clear out their orbits so that we no longer had impacts every five minutes or so. Earth has done this. Pluto has not done this yet. So the good thing is give Pluto another five billion years and then Pluto is going to be a planet again. And probably a good planet because it's going to be far away from the dread giant sun that it's not going to be eaten up. So maybe in 5 billion years, Pluto is the new Earth. I don't know. OK, so if there are no more questions, but you have any questions later on, just send me an email. Oh, there's another question. Will it be potentially feasible to increase the Martian atmosphere? I don't know. That's a good question. So would it be more feasible to increase the Martian atmosphere or lessen Venus, less Venus's atmosphere? probably less than Venus atmosphere because we just have to figure out how we unplug it and have everything evaporate in space. So I would go with Venus in there. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so anybody has a question about anything class related, this class, any other classes, feel free to send me an email. For admissions, please send an email to Catherine Tipton. And OK, so everybody have a nice day. And then hopefully see you on campus in the fall semester or summer semester even. OK, bye. Thank you.